Fast forward. Jen's also going to see if uh, we can stretch things. Okay. Um, the agenda today, a little bit about me, which I've been talking about, what I'm thinking, I'm, why, why the talk, why, why are we talking about pen testing. Uh, basically, I'm going to give you my thoughts and ideas, and hopefully we'll have some time to discuss it at the end of the time. Um, there's my um, uh, contact information if you guys ever want to get in touch with me by the end of the talk, if you still want to speak to me. That's what I used to look like back in my pen testing at NSA days when I had hair and had power. Um, if you guys have ever heard of uh, Paul Security Weekly, I'm one of the hosts there. I try to get on there at least once a month. I'm getting on there more often now since I'm actually currently unemployed. Um, I'm also a Jedi Master. Uh, there's a story behind that, which I don't have time to tell, uh, but really I'm a Trekkie. The original series, not uh, any of the cheap imitation remakes. <laughs> Um, my 33 years of in information and security experience starting at NSA, ending up as a QSA, and then you know the last couple of years just been doing kind of the evangelism curmudgeon role. Um, to put things in context, when I started at NSA, everybody know what that thing is? Yeah. What is that thing? This is inter interactive things. Enigma. It's the Enigma, thank you. It was still a secret that we, we and our allies, the, the Brits, had broken that. Why do you think that is? Nope. There are countries still using it. It was not revealed. I started in 86 at NSA. It wasn't revealed that that technology had been broken. I want to say till like 88, 89, something like that. Um, while I was at NSA primarily, as I was telling you guys, I did cryptanalysis. I, I bounced around. I was actually there. There was a little conflict in the desert before the last 13 years called Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Um, I was involved in that from the civilian side of things on the, on the operational side. Um, and then what I was telling you guys initially uh, was I got into pen testing at NSA. We were setting up doing ethical hacking pen testing because the office that I was in was fielded systems evaluations. I give a talk about my old days as a crippy. You can find it on YouTube. It's called Tales from the Crypt Analyst. Um, I ended up in this office that was called Fielded Systems Evaluations. Uh, NSA discovered, uh, or somebody had this brilliant idea that the way that we often break the adversaries' communication systems and encryption systems is we, is people don't use them right. They reuse key, they, they forget to switch some switches, they find bat bypasses, is that, it, you know, does any of this sound familiar? Um, I disagreed with one thing the keynote said, that he said something about how pen testing has changed so much and the industry has changed so much over the years. I'm like, yeah, I don't think it's changed much at all. That's another talk. Um, but because we were doing fielded systems evaluations and, there was, and networking was becoming more popular, we started looking at network systems, which got us into pen testing and ethical hacking and vulnerability discovery and so on and so forth. Um, has anybody heard of this book? Now that you're going to get a voucher for a free book, I might recommend this. It came out earlier this year. It's a book called Dark Territory, The Secret History of Cyber War. Um, there's a chapter, chapter four, called Eligible Receiver. And in that chapter, there's this following statement. The NSA had a similar group called the Red Team. It was part of the Information Assurance Director, Directorate, formerly called the Information Security Directorate, the defensive side of the NSA stationed in Fanex, the building out near Friendship Airport. During its most sensitive drills, the red team worked out of a chamber called the pit, which was so secret that few people at NSA knew it existed. And even they couldn't enter without first passing through combination lock, two combination locked doors. Are you intrigued? Are you excited? The pit is the name of the office I used to work in. So we're famous. Uh, this is the Fanex complex. They actually spelled it wrong in the book. It's just F-A-N-X. This is right outside of BWI Airport. If you've ever flown into or out of BWI Airport, uh, NSA was most of those buildings, and still might be today, for all I know. And uh, Friendship Annex, BWI Airport used to be called Friendship Airport, so it was just Friendship Airport Annex or Friendship Annex. Um, the pit was in that building there, and it was on, uh, gosh, what floor was I on? It was 20 years ago. I want to say we were on the second floor, in that corner. 
Uh, I give another talk about those times. Uh, be on the lookout for it. I actually submitted it for ShmooCon. Hope I'm still waiting to see whether they'll accept it or not. But again, that's another story for another day. Pen testing. Um, I started to tell you guys, I, I came out in the commercial world, I did pen testing for about five years in the commercial world, um, and then got away from it, got into doing PCI work, QSA work, and you know, sort of wasn't doing anything technical per se for quite a few years, and only got back into it the last couple years uh, when I started coming out to conferences again. So. I'm at DerbyCon 2014, Ed Scotus is the presenter, he's giving a keynote on uh, how to do the, how to give the best pen test of your life. And I'm like, oh that's cool, I'm going to learn about how pen testing has changed over the last 10 or so years since I've been sort of away from the hacker community. And so I'm sitting there listening very anxiously and, and these are some of the points that he had, and, you know, this talk's up on YouTube, you can find it. Uh, these were his key points. The, the best pen test of your, of your life has great value, provides previously unknown insights, so on and so forth. He talked about, you know, you've got limited budget, limited, limited amounts, unlimited amounts of time. You can, you know, go everywhere, do everything, get all the best results. Um, but it kind of left me, I, I, got a, I got a little bit irritated while I'm listening to this talk. It bugged me a little bit because, first of all, he didn't uh, define what a pen test was. Uh, and I think that's kind of important because if you don't know what you're getting into, how do you know if you've been successful or not? Um, even, even beyond defining a pen test, just defining what the goals of a pen test are. I mean, what is a pen test? Anybody want, I mean, assuming there's no right or wrong answer, anybody want to take a stab at what is a pen test? Test controls. Test controls? Assessment of the network. Assessment of the network? Okay. I mean, these are, you know, that's... Keep going. I mean, a pen test can be many, many things. I found in the early days when I came out, uh, in, it's been 20 years ago, into the commercial sector, everybody wanted to have a pen test because everybody was plugging their networks uh, and their, their what used to be closed internal systems, they were attaching them to the internet and they wanted to know how to secure it. And of course, the industry was born where you know, first you had to go out and do assessments and scanning tools became available, firewalls were available to protect the perimeter. Right. And, and I'm sorry? Prioritize Yeah, I mean, all sorts of stuff was going on, but it all started with, it all started then with, you've got things in place already, let's do a pen test. But really when I would talk to my customers and ask them, what do you want to get out of the pen test? And they're like, I don't know, I, I just know we need a pen test. And I'd say, well, do you want us to find a way into your network? or do you want us to find all the ways we can get into your network? Invariably, they said, well, I, we want you to find all the holes. We want you to plug everything, you know, discover everything. I said, okay, but that's not a pen test. That's a vulnerability assessment. So really pen testing, what I did primarily in the early days was far more often a vulnerability assessment. There were times where there was exceptions, but most people wanted to know everything that was wrong. That's a vulnerability assessment. I go away for 10 years, I come back, we're still talking about vulnerability assessment. So, um, you know, again, there's no necessarily right or wrong answers. It's what do you want to get out of a pen test? You know, what's the goal of a pen test? Back in my day when I was doing it many years ago, the goal was to get root. Uh, nowadays it's more administrative access, but you know, I was doing mostly Unix-based networks back then. So, you know, we, would, we had our little fun stuff we did, you know, we got the root dance and, you know, we had all sorts of little stupid things that we did, high-fiving each other when we got root. Um, sometimes the, the objective was, can you get here? Can you get to a particular system? Can you get to a particular data set or database? Uh, we had an executive at NSA uh, put a file in, in one of his directories in one of his folders and the, the objective was, can you get to this file? And of course we got to it and we added a message to, in response to the message that he'd written in this little text file. Um, you know, is it discovery? Is it, uh, I used to hear this a lot, uh, uh, talking to customers, we don't do that. We don't store that data. You know, are you capturing sensitive, like, social security information or in the credit card industry? Are you capturing and storing the sensitive authentication data, the three or four digits? Oh, no, 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 we don't capture that. Well, you're accepting it here on your website. Yeah, yeah, but we don't store it. Well, inevitably, when, when customers said, we don't do that, 
our job was to discover, oh yeah, you do. And, and you know, so it was an educational exercise, perhaps. Um, lots of different reasons, and they're all legitimate, really, if you just go into the pen test with, this is what we want to get out of the pen test. Um, one of the things I've also seen in the gap over the years is sort of, uh, and anybody know what that is, the reference, Kobayashi Maru? It's a movie reference from Star Trek. Which one? Come on, shout it out. We don't have time. It's Star Trek II, the original series, The Wrath of Khan. The, the spoiler alert, if you've not seen the movie, one of the themes going through the movie is Captain Kirk is the only cadet at Starfleet Academy that ever defeated this unbeatable test, which was called the Kobayashi Maru. The point of the test was to see how a cadet would react in an unwinnable situation. So it's, it's sort of a holodeck, uh, you know, role play. They're on the bridge and they're being overrun by Klingons and the ship's about to be destroyed. All lives are going to be lost. How do you handle that? That's the point of the exercise. Captain Kirk was the only one who had ever defeated it. And it turns out at the end of the movie, what he did was he hacked into the application and changed it so that there was an outcome where he could win. Boy, you know, that's what, you know, pen testing in the early days, you know, people got good at the firewalls and the perimeter pr protections, then we started talking about, but what if you're an insider? Where can you go from here? Uh, social engineering came about. Well, you know, what if people are breaking in? What are people are sending you phishing messages? We've lear you know, learned a lot about that this morning. So a anytime a, def a defense goes up, you figure out a new way to, to, to you know, side sidestep it and get in. So. Is that legitimate or is that not legitimate? These are the questions that I asked. So I mentioned I was a QSA. Um, I, I, I came into this talk a few years ago and, and my mind uh, mindset is really based on uh, the PCI standard. Uh, have any of you guys ever seen this before? Is this new to you? Um, the PCI data security standard has six overarching goals, which I would argue are pretty comprehensive, technology independent, and they're split up into 12 major requirements, and from there, it's, I've lost count, there's 400 and some odd sub-requirements. Um, and I did say PCI, so go ahead and insert your, uh, your stupid PCI auditor now. Um, these are some of the PCI, actually, these are most of the PCI customers I had over the years. Um, in the middle there, TGX companies, Heartland. There's other companies up there that claim, uh, their claim to fame is that they were famously breached in the mid, mid to late 2000s. So the team that I was involved with uh, was responsible for going into a lot of these breached company, com companies in the, in the mid to late 2000s and, and do the cleanup and get them really on board with PCI and security. So not the typical, I'm not the typical PCI QSA. Um, the uh, data security standard in version three, which came out uh, end of 2013, they finally introduced detail into what a pen test is supposed to be. PCI has always required pen testing uh, since the very beginnings of the, of the standard 12 years ago. But they never really defined what it was. And I looked at a lot of pen test results as my, in my role as a QSA over the years. You have to do it inside. You have to do it outside. But there was really never any definition of what it was supposed to be, uh, any definition of should it be automated or manual or some combination. You know, what is it exactly? So finally, PCI came out uh, with a, a document that kind of put it in detail, and then they put it into the standard. This is what's supposed to be in a pen test, and it starts with have a documented methodology. What a great idea. Have a set of ground rules, and, and um, you, know, you can read through that. It, it's, it's pretty comprehensive. Inside, outside, what does that mean? And oh, not just inside, outside your network, but inside, outside what's known as the card data environment, your, your more sensitive systems. Uh, do it at the network level. Do it at the application layer. Great idea. Um, they have this nice definition of a pen test, and uh, um, we don't have time to let you read it all. Let me paraphrase. It's pretty good, and it says, uh, and this is something that PCI is famous for, they get down to uh, really what constitutes a pen test is 
exploitation or attempted exploitation of discovered vulnerabilities, risks, holes, bugs, whatever you want to call it. Where they failed, in my opinion, is they, they, they say it should be a manual process, but they didn't say it must be a manual process. The pen testers that I used to work with, we, we kind of prided on ourselves on it being a manual process. And I think a lot of the pen testing community, a lot of the Ed Scotuses and the big names, you know, they all talk about it really should be manual. It's got to be you against the world, not, uh, what do they call it, puppy mill automated tools and things like that. But they allowed it because there's a lot of companies in the PCI world that are selling automated pen test tools that companies use to, to, uh, to meet the requirement. So the operative thing here is ex exploitation. The, the gap is between manual and automated. That's my paraphrase. But here's, here's what really got to me. In the world of PCI, where companies are supposed to be basically implementing a comprehensive security program, and they're all supposed, they're supposed to be, it's sort of linear, building secure systems, building secure networks, maintaining them, keeping them secure, having endpoint protection in place, having monitoring in place, having logging in place, having intrusion detection in place, having a vulnerability management program in place that's patching systems on a regular basis as critical patches are coming out, uh, you know, responding to events, revisiting everything as new things are discovered, doing vulnerability scanning, you know, the scanning tools that are out there are, are, you know, they try to stay up to date with all the latest, greatest bugs and vulnerabilities and misconfigurations that are out there. And if you're supposed to be doing all of that, then why do you need a pen test? Any initial response to that? It's not going to catch let that question simmer for a minute. The things that I saw most often, especially in my PCI uh, days of why people wanted to do the pen test, first and foremost was to meet the compliance requirement. Um, again, most companies wanted to treat the pen test as a vulnerability assessment, find all the problems. Um, we did in our days of pen testing when I used to do it, we, we started dabbling into the testing of the of the defense mechanisms, uh, you know, especially when IDS was first coming out. Uh, you know, it became kind of a cat and mouse game. You know, if you do a certain amount of activity, do the detection mechanisms trigger an alert and, and you're caught. And so we used to come in stealthy and gradually sort of turn up the volume. Unfortunately, back in those days, and I don't know if it's changed a whole lot, we'd kind of, you know, we'd kind of spin the volume to 11 and still nothing would happen. They still didn't detect us. Um, and what we tried to do with our pen testing results was try to make it turn the results, the reports, into learning opportunities. Hey, uh, here's things that are wrong with your network. Here's things with the fundamental ways that you're going around doing networking or just simply you're unaware of what you've plugged into and what are the, the features and the capabilities of the technologies that you're using. Um, In my opinion, and this is where I'm, I'm going to be a little soapboxy, uh, I kind of felt like, you know, pen testing has been around for like 25 years, give or take. Some could argue longer, but, you know, network, you know as long as network systems have been around, there's been some concept of penetration testing. And what was nagging at me is, again, if, if people are doing all the right things from a, a, a security perspective, from a building a program perspective, um, why still pen test, especially pen tests, and I, I think I've seen it enough in the last couple of years that I've been coming to these hacker conferences, listening to a lot of talks about pen testing. There's still a lot of pen testing that's done, in my opinion, for the purposes of vulnerability assessment. Like this whole thing called security that we do starts with a pen test, starts with discovery. And while I think discovery is legitimate and pen testing is fun, I wonder about the uh, especially if I'm doing it as a consultant or a third party for a customer, you know, is it really the most cost effective way to educate and aware and find problems and find, find issues and goals and misconfigurations and things like that? So uh, where my head is, is that, you know, penetration testing in terms of what it is and, and what you're doing in terms of the goals should start to be more focused on 
uh, not vulnerabilities because you've supposedly got mechanisms in place to find and discover and keep keep your arms around vulnerabilities. And by the way, they're pervasive and ongoing and they're always going to be more and more vulnerabilities. But maybe pen testing should really start to focus more on the threats. Um, it was talked about a little bit, you know, a specific type of threat or threat agent was discussed in the keynote this morning. But yeah, how do you protect against phishing? If that's a common way for the bad guys and the attackers to comp compromise networks. Um, there's more automated attacks that are out there today. When, when I first started out, it was people trying to break into systems and, and act, you know, actually breaking in, getting through the firewall, getting into the internal network, and what the hell is an internal network these days? Um, but the, you know, so the technology has changed, the landscape has changed, the fundamentals, the, 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 the philosophies I don't think have changed a whole lot. There's bad guys, and I think I, I, I left his talk early, I don't know how much he went into this, but there's bad guys, there's threat agents that may or may not want to do something to you, your company, who you're working for, your customer. It's good to take time to figure out who that might be and what their motivation might be. Take a step outside of the technical realm of everything. He was touching on that a little bit. Um, but here's where I was at. My idea of the ideal pen test, yeah, you have a good solid methodology, you know what your goals are, Every, all parties agree, this is the objective of the pen test. But, and again, with my thinking that this is a customer, this is somebody that I'm trying to help become more secure and to protect whatever it is they're trying to protect. At the end of the day, when the pen test is performed, I get no results. It's a fail. That to me is the ideal pen test because the company is secure. Or my attempts, the pen testing attempts, are detected and detected early and blocked, or at least you know, the red flags go off, the alarms go off, and, and there's a response. That to me is a perfect pen, pen test. Not one that finds more vulnerabilities. And if you ask a lot of pen testers, um, you know, Security Weekly a month or two ago, we had a guy on that, had, that works for a pen test company, and he had gone through a bunch of their customers and just did a survey of how did we break in, how did we get access, admin access, global domain access, and he, and he, he categorized it. And the top five ways was exploitation of trust relationships, passwords, passwords, you know, weak shared passwords, common passwords, some variation of passwords, and basically lack of segmentation, a flat network. You know, everything can see everything. I'm like, that's what the F it was 25 years ago. Why are we still doing pen tests finding that stuff? When I used to do pen tests, if we found something like a default faster password, we'd stop the exercise and say, we don't need to be pen testing you. We need to, we need to spend your money educating you. I had a customer one time that they had, they had just installed a firewall. It was a brand new firewall, top of the line firewall. 20 some years ago, so you probably have never heard of the product. Um, they'd gone through all the training classes, they got their cert certificates, they set it up. This is back in the days when firewall rule sets were like 25, 30 rules. So it was pretty basic. Um, the idea of a DMZ was actually, you had actual network segments that were sort of linear, not multi-homed like they are today, not all on a virtual device like they are today. Well, we started poking them from the outside, and it was like, there was no firewall there. And we went inside, and, and we, we would start on the outside, go on the inside. And while we were on the inside, they started getting DOS. And of course, we were the ones blamed. So we said, time out, let's look at your firewall rules. Well, we're looking at their very short list of firewall rules, and the final rule was, any, any, allow. So I said, time out, we're done. We're not doing a pen test anymore. We're going we're gonna to teach you guys how to architect your network and set up firewall rules that actually work. And, and that was a seminal moment for me in my career because when we presented this to the customer, uh, I want to say it was their CFO, he's like, wow, that's the smartest engagement I've ever seen. Because usually when we hire people to do a job, they just do the job and take the money and, you know, well, you paid for us to do it. So that's sort of... That, that helped to mold my career and my attitude that I should always help the customer and do the right thing regardless of what the contract says. So anyway, um, I really think we're not there yet as an industry. Pen testing still comes up way too much in terms of vulnerability discovery. 
Um, and while I think pen testing is important and legitimate, I think it's a, a safety net exercise. It's, it's a live fire exercise that you do after you've done all the things that you think you can do to protect your network. That really it's much more uh, threat based. It's, it's uh, being creative. You know, what if we do have an insider? What if we've pissed off somebody in development? Or what if we've pissed off, pissed off somebody in accounting? What if we uh, hire third party uh, cleaning crews that come in overnight? You know, it's okay and it's legitimate to test all these different scenarios. Hopefully, because you've already gone through the exercise of uh, what are the bad guys? Who are the bad guys? Why would they come after us? What would they be trying to get? What are we trying to protect at the end of the day? Um, so just applying a little bit more logic perhaps and more of a, a flow to it, not just simply, well, pen testing is a way to discover more vulnerabilities. Um, a lot of the guys on the Security Weekly show are pen testers and they talk about, yo, I just did this really cool job and we found a default password. I'm like, how are you writing that up as a vulnerability? Um, because to me, the, the finding is not, I found a default password. To me, the finding is you've got something wrong with your security program that allows a default password to be out there in the first place. There's something in terms of the processes, and by processes I primarily mean the manual, the people applying and doing all the things. Um, one time we did a pen test where we were hired to just look at the firewall. Single interface, single IP address, we were hired to just, can you break in through the firewall? And while we were just doing sort of scanning of their environment, um, we saw web servers and they were not part of the scope of our engagement, but we poked enough to say, these look like default installs. This is back in probably Windows NT days and uh, out of the box systems, internet facing, probably we're talking inside as well as outside. And we didn't touch them. We didn't ex go beyond the contract. It was a bank or an insurance company that would have sued us if we went beyond. But when we reported our findings, we said, you know, your firewall is great, but there's a stuff over here that we're pretty sure we could have used to get in and, and, and break into your network. Another seminal moment in my career, the, whoever we were presenting to at that point turned to his people and said, what's wrong with our processes that were allowing our people to put these boxes out on the internet? And I was like, wow, that's exactly the right question to ask. What's wrong with our processes? Um, you mentioned, somebody mentioned risk earlier. We don't teach the risk equation anymore. Everything in this industry is focused on vulnerabilities. But guess what? Vulnerability is just a portion of an equation that evaluates risk. And there's probably 10,000 mathematical equations out there to attempt to try to put a number or a value to risk. To me, it's got to be higher level and more intuitive. Um, and I've always tried to break it down to simple math. You know, there's, and this is what I learned in my DOD days. You have vulnerabilities, you have threats. There's the things that you do to protect against the vulnerabilities and the threats that is somehow reducing whatever this value is. But there's this overarching multiplier, especially in terms of the commercial world, not so much in terms of the DOD, of the value of what it is you're trying to protect. What it is you're trying to protect might be sensitive data, it might be financial data, it might be consumer data, it might be your rep corporate reputation. How do you put a dollar value on that? How do you defi define what the risk is and how much you invest against protecting it against the bad things happening? Especially if it's qualitative. I'm sorry? Especially if it's qualitative. Especially if it's qualitative. And, uh, it, you know, I would, I've talked to many customers over the years, especially in the early days, you know, what do you not want to happen? Well, we don't want to get our names in the, you know, it used to be in the newspaper, now it would be on Krebs. Right? You know, we don't want to be the next company that's you know, victimized and have, has our name plastered all over the place. I'm so, okay, how much do you want to protect against it? I mean, the story that I, that I will tell hopefully at ShmooCon is about one of the uh, early uh, forensics exercises that we did for a customer that had to do with just their website being defaced. I mean, who cares about their website de being defaced? Well, large companies, especially in the early days, that cared about corporate reputation and what, what how might this impact our value, you know, our, our stock value, our stock prices, our corporate image, our customer, you know, customer confidence in, in conducting business with us. Hard to do. We need to talk more about this. And oh, by the way, I've heard people say this just in the last couple months, because I've gone out to conferences and, and trade shows and, and I've seen companies that advertise, we're experts on threat. I'm like, 
what's a threat? I'm like, uh, well, it's a risk. I'm like, no, it's not. It's part of a, an equation that leads you to what risk is. So we need to learn what these terms are and what they mean, and you don't have to agree on an exact absolute value, but for the love of God, have, understand, have some understanding of the interplay and how these are component parts of this overall nebulous thing that we call risk. Frankly, we're in the risk business. We're not in the security business. I mean, that's my bottom line. Um, you know, how do you do this? And this sort of bleeds into some of the other talks that, I, that I've given that are out there. You know, we need to become educators. We're the ones that know what's bad and know what's wrong. So we need to figure out how to convey and communicate that to people. Uh, I've heard referred to as muggles or the stupid people or the real people or the ordinary people. Uh, which implies we need to be humble and stop calling the people that we're trying to convince to do things differently, uh, implying that they're stupid. Um, you know, I, I can go on and on about this, but uh, you know, as a, as a consultant, to me, it's all about communication and it's really uh, persuasive speech. You're trying to convince somebody to change behavior, spend money, do something differently, invest in different things. That and where most of the commercial world just wants to buy technology, drop in some new product, and it's gonna do everything for me so I don't have to think. I mean, that's really, the, that's really what we're up against a lot of times. We've only got about five minutes. Um, any questions, comments, pushback, feedback? Agree with me, disagree with me, it's okay. Yes, sir. I've, I've noticed that that three-letter agency that you had previous employment mm -hmm. often used the term pen testing for laboratory-type assessments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it, this goes back to what is a pen test. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of the, the, the research community, vulnerability research community, bug bounty, security research community, there's all legitimate reasons for trying to find vulnerabilities and bugs and things that are wrong with the technologies that we use. I just don't think that's a pen test. We call it a pen test. We kind of lump it all together. But to me, security research in vulnerability discovery is a different exercise than pen testing. That makes sense. Yes? What's your thoughts on the execution standard, pen test execution standard? Uh, I haven't read it. Um, so, I, mean, do you guys, I mean, the companies you work with, they start accepting it? or I mean, that, we built our company methodology off mm -hmm. of a lot of what that. I have that referenced in there somewhere, but I, I haven't looked at it in a while. Um, what I think is important, actually, I think it's referenced in the uh, in the PCI documentation. Or, or maybe a better question would be, what's the, you know, truly the benefit to a methodology in a pen test and the importance of that versus? So, yeah, I guess, I guess depending on what methodology you're following or what industry accepted methodology you're following, I think the importance of following a methodology is understanding what the goals and what the outcomes are. I mean, I used to ask my customers, uh, okay, so we're going to do this exercise, whatever it is, we're going to produce a report. What are you hoping to get out of it? You know, what are, you know who's the consumer? What are they looking for? Um, especially in the PCI world, I, you know, you might imagine as a QSA, I sometimes went into hostile environments because I was just the stupid auditor. I happened to know a little bit about security, so sometimes I had to kind of win, win the technical people over that I had to talk to. And one of the ways I did that is says, look, you guys understand your network far better than I do, uh, and I'm sure you're, you know what you need. Uh, I'm your best friend right now because if we can slap PCI on it, guess what? You're going to get it. And lo and behold, they would, and I won many friends. And, again, that's part of the trust relationship. Yeah. All right, we've got to wrap it up. Sorry, guys. The, we got well, thank compressed. You. But thank, you. thank you so much.